Right, good. Everyone's uh, pretty much here, I believe, especially my students, okay? Uh, please, I hope all of you are ready. I don't see your names there. Uh, I hope you're watching this. Hi, Ria. All right, uh, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Education crash course. We have uh, done two crash courses already, uh, the science and tech crash course two weeks ago. Uh, the response was really good. Uh, and then after that, uh, we did uh, another crash course on the environment. We had more people and uh, a little too much for Zoom to handle. That's why we had to move to YouTube Live right now. Uh, I gotta say this uh, again. Uh, hi, Rebecca, Clarence. Yeah, I gotta say this again, guys. I don't uh, have any prior experience in using YouTube Live. First time uh, I'm using this. I don't know who's gonna be watching There's some dude in, I don't know, Germany, Africa, perhaps. Uh, so uh, I, hope, I hope everything goes well right uh, today. Okay? The whole goal of today is to get you prepared for addressing this topic, education for GP, okay? in case it comes out. Okay? Hopefully you have uh, the tools, uh, the knowledge to tackle it. Okay? Okay, if you would like to ask me anything, okay, you can put it in the chat group um, in that chat uh, over there, but the chat itself uh, sometimes it gets buried. You know, when we ask the questions, sometimes perhaps okay, uh, you, you your 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 thing disappears, your questions disappear. So if you want to ask questions, especially pertaining to GP, right? Could you use this link, please? Uh, you scan this, I will be able to see your questions in a separate platform, a, a Q and A platform. Okay, so why don't um, yeah, some of you, if you have any questions, you know, uh, post one right there. Okay, I'm going to leave this here for a minute. Okay, so this is primarily how we're gonna take on Q&A questions. Uh, I won't answer them uh, immediately, so we wait for a while, and then uh, at different, uh, uh, during the breaks perhaps, okay, we're gonna do uh, a proper Q&A. Okay, just to give you a, a sense of what's gonna happen over the next uh, one and one and a half hours. Okay. Education crash course uh, typically doesn't take as long. I hope uh, I can let you guys off uh, by 12.15, uh, perhaps. So what's going to be happening, I'll introduce uh, to you the education topic. A lot of you are already a little bit familiar with this. We will use three questions to sort of uh, jumpstart this whole thing. Okay, Three questions. Are schools still relevant today? Can education solve poverty? and should education focus only on what is important? These three are kind of like um, the bread and butter of education. Okay, of course, there are many other topics out there, but these three will address a lot of issues we have in education. I'm going to give a case study on a particular country that you will find very useful, uh, hopefully. Okay. And uh, short quizzes are going to be there for those of you who have, uh, who have attended our science, our environment, crash causes, uh, and Q&A in the middle and at the end. Just a quick introduction. For those of you, some of you are just joining us for the first time. Okay, uh, some of you have seen me many times already. So I'm gonna repeat this, it's like a repeat telecast. My name is KP, okay, KP Chua. Uh, we are from first class. We are a group of tutors uh, who focus on secondary and JC subjects. Okay, and please, please, uh, Oh dear, there was one guy who came in and told me, oh, the crash course. Uh, I found out that one guy was referring to me as a crash course guy, okay? I'll be so disappointed if you know me as the crash course guy. You know, it's almost like going to a doctor and say he's the stethoscope guy. Okay? <laughs> so I do a lot of things besides crash course, okay? We have lessons, we have English, secondary English, uh, we have JCGP, we have classes. Uh, we have, I uh, also do digital marketing. Uh, I, I do a little bit of business consulting. Okay, I brew my own beer. Okay, I'm a lot more than a crash course guy. Okay, but uh, over time, you get to know me a little bit better. Hey, since this is about education, I would like to share a picture that I took 
uh, when I was studying in university. This is me and my friend in a lecture. Okay, as you can tell, this is the reason why I failed a lot of subjects in school. Okay, everyone was listening, but I simply <laughs> I was playing games with my friend. Okay, so university life, a lot of you are going to be very... Um, uh, anticipating, uh, you, you probably anticipate university life is very fun, four years of fun. I still uh, reminisce about it once in a while. It's really, really awesome. Okay, compared to JC life and even like post university or working life, I would say university life is like the best experience you're gonna have. Okay, you guys should really look forward to it, honestly. Hey, how do you participate in our crash course? Uh, do participate in the chat. You have things you wanna ask, you have things you wanna say. When I ask the questions, okay, post it in the chat. Um, we okay. Sorry, we don't have a moderator today because this is YouTube live. Okay, I moderate myself. Okay, please uh, try to keep it uh, free from like expletives. Okay, some of you I don't know how many of you are from Singapore. I believe some of you are not um, not in Singapore. Okay, you just stumble upon this channel. Okay, so yep, do uh, this is for education purpose. So do keep it decent. Okay, um, we have students here. We have tutors. Uh, we have teachers. Okay, uh, watching us today uh, because we are covering education today, guys. The things I say may offend some, okay, especially those who are teachers. Okay, I'm I'm not uh, teaching in school myself. Okay, I'm a tuition teacher. Uh, so um, okay, if you have anything you, know, you you might not agree with me, okay, I, uh, let me first apologize and you know, we can have a discussion after that. Okay, I will share my contact with you guys. You can uh, you can talk to me after this. Uh, do bring your pen and paper. Content booklet will be shared at the end. We will send it out. Um, ah, okay. We will send it out through uh, probably email. I'll, I'll let you know how to get a content booklet at the end. Okay. Recording will be available on YouTube. Again, if you miss out, if there's any technical issue, glitch, okay, uh, let us know. And I'm using freaking M1. M1 has been giving me a lot of issues, right? Right, guys, we use M1. It keeps disconnecting. Is that right? Okay, I know some of you, okay, some, some M1 users already complained to me. Okay, uh, if I get dis disconnected, okay, just wait for a while. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe I'll freeze there, like, uh, doing, I'm, I'm, as if I'm doing a mannequin challenge. Okay, aha, uh -huh, yes. Stupid M1, do something, M1. M1, if you're watching this, do something. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting on my nerves again. My, and then people living in the house, they were so pissed by it. Okay, so be patient if there's any technical issue. Uh, we will come back on. Uh, we'll come uh, back online. Usually, if there's an outage, you usually last for maybe uh, I don't know a minute or two. Firstly, what kind of questions can you expect in education? Let me share my screen with you guys. Hey, education. What sort of questions? Okay, uh, pay attention here. Okay, those of you who are attempting education questions <clears throat> hey there are i think in general uh four to five main types of education question you need to know what to expect for this topic the first one is the purpose of education like why do we go to school is it to get a job Okay, is it to enlighten ourselves? Okay, what exactly is um, the purpose of going to school? Uh, now, there, there isn't a lot of uh, controversy in the fact that we should go to school. No, okay, we all, all over the world, people agree that children, okay, students should, should go to school, teenagers should go to school, okay, because uh, there's a lot of benefit in that. So that's, that's pretty much settled. If anyone tells you uh, don't go to school, okay, uh, they are probably looking at other issues like maybe don't go to university perhaps okay they're not telling you don't go to primary school or secondary school so when you think about education okay try to broaden your mind a little bit and have the clarity education is pretty broad okay we have the primary school education secondary uh higher education and then for people like me uh we have adult education i'm taking some courses actually uh i'm also a student in fact uh i think during uh, before the last crash course you saw like i had like very heavy eye bags because i just finished my assignment i had to, I had to submit uh, my assignment like uh, the, the night before that, I'm like, oh, oh crap. Okay, <clears throat> okay uh, the second kind of uh, questions will be uh, some controversy, some of the drawbacks of education. Some people believe that education deepens inequality, perhaps. 
uh, or even promotes this unhealthy conformity culture. So those are the kind of like the drawbacks of school. Um, and uh, we do agree that we should go to school, we should learn, uh, but we cannot agree on what we have to learn. So there's a lot of debate going on about the focus of education. Should we teach the arts? Should we teach them just things that are useful? Should we teach them um, uh, humanities, you know, all these things, skills, values? Is it, is it the school's responsibility? If you graduate highly educated but lacking in character, okay, what should we teach in school? The, the what to teach part. And then uh, there are questions about modern education using technology, uh, we, we're going to cover on MOOC, MOOC, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And those are the, the sort of questions that you should be prepared for when you address education. Okay. Uh, what have we done in education so far? Okay, some efforts. Uh, in the past, we had the Millennium Development Goal which lasted until 2015. It's a 15-year goal. Um, Millennium Development Goal has been replaced okay, uh, by Sustainable Development Goals, which will last from 2015 to 2030. This was a, like a goal set by the UN. It is, uh, if you ask me, it's, it's kind of like meaningless to the individual countries, but then we, uh, w when it comes to like multilateral agencies like UN, they have something to work towards. They know where to, where to divert their resources to. One of the goals in, sus uh, in SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, is to improve girls' education. Mm. Correction, to, is to improve education. By 2030, do take note of this, the goal is to have all girls and boys okay, attend school completely free. And they, it should be equitable and quality primary secondary education. That's six years of education. Oh, sorry, six plus four, uh, 10 years of education, free. So this free, equitable, quality, these three words are very important, these three words. Okay? So this, guys, I'm sharing this with you because you can use it as a bang in your introduction. Other efforts would be educating girls. Some of you would know this lady. Her name is Malala. Uh, hang on, let me just check that everything is working. Okay, yeah. Her name is Malala. Malala is a champion in girls' education. If you read her story, you would know she was shot by the Taliban uh, while championing girls' education. And right now, she's living in the UK. She cannot, uh, I, I don't think she can still go back to Pakistan, where she originally was from. She has been like the face of girls' education. But let's talk about other people who are championing girls' education. You know this uh, lady. Michelle, okay, uh, Mr. Obama's wife. Uh, Michelle Obama has been championing education for girls. She's been doing a lot of things in promoting gender equalities. Uh, so has Bill Gates uh, and Melinda Gates, the Bill and Melinda Foundation. Okay, they are, they are putting money into educating girls, into improving gender equality. How much has been dedicated? $600 million in this program called Let Girls Learn, right? Now, our first question, are schools still relevant today? Relevant, the word relevant tells you a couple of things. Like, has it become outdated because of s some changes in the world? So think about that. And relevant can also mean, like, is it, is it still good? Like, has it achieved certain ob objectives that it set out to achieve? Um, also think about whether it has any drawback do schools actually cause any sort of drawbacks? I did tell you, schools actually have some drawbacks, remember? Okay, we're gonna cover those things. Here, yeah. five points, too expensive. Okay, five points for uh, no longer relevant. Then we talk about how it is still relevant today. Okay. Number one, kind of expensive. Okay, when I say school, I'm, I'm, using, a, I'm using it very vaguely. Uh, Let's talk about higher education, school in the higher education. Obama, he only finished paying off his tuition loan at the age of 44, zero. Okay, <laughs> such a rich guy, okay. He, he, tuition loan is a big problem, guys, especially in countries in the United States. In Singapore, 
your tuition loan is covered by the government. Uh, uh, sorry, not your tuition loan. Your tuition, uh, tuition fees are subsidized by the government. So do try to get into a local university if your family circumstances you know, are not like that ideal. Um, when you get into local universities, the government pays 75% of it. 75%. You only pay like a quarter of it. Can you imagine that? Uh, this, you save a lot of money, guys. So don't be like Obama, okay? He, there was no subsidy in the US. He had to pay a debt. Today, tuition loan debt is 1.6 trillion. T trillion, guys. 1.6 trillion. That's a lot, a lot of money. That's like how much money we're pumping into the, the, the COVID-19 uh, rescue package, you know? Um, now, Bernie Sanders, this guy who was a Democrat, he was very concerned about this tuition loan problem. He believes that it is driving people into, uh, uh, it is preventing people and disincentivizing people from getting further education, which is bad, okay? That is possibly one of the reasons why American education system is not that robust. Okay, you look at the PISA ranking, the PISA ranking, they regularly rank like kind of at the bottom. Okay, this it is some systemic problem in America. Okay, university is a business over there. So he did say this. He wants to end the absurdity of sentencing an entire generation of young people for doing the right thing, which is to go to school. Okay, and it, it has become a crime to go to school because of tuition loan. Another issue with education today, as compared to the past, is very stressful. This picture was taken in China. In, uh, in the school in Hebei. In China, some of you would know, because uh, some of you are from China yourself, there is, a, uh, there is this system, it's like A-levels, but it's a lot more stressful than A-levels, it's called a Gao Kao. Gao Kao, okay, is so stressful, and it's such a high stake exam, that students regularly feel so stressed that it drove up suicide rates every year. You see these stories, these are not new stories. It's gotten so bad. Now, you don't need statistics for this. All you gotta know is schools have gone, they've taken the drastic measures of putting up these suicide barriers. These are called suicide barriers. Prevent students from jumping, okay? Now, um, now suicide is a sensitive topic. Um, guys, uh, if you ever feel like you are really suffering from anxiety, from school, okay, uh, do get help, okay? Uh, you can talk to someone talk to, uh, there's a lot of helplines out there, okay, or if you need to talk to me, okay, uh, talk to me, cool? Okay, next thing. Stress is a perennial problem in school nowadays, even in America, okay? I would think America is not that stressful, but apparently it's not the case. Three quarter of students regularly feel stressed, three quarter, feel stressed by their school work. Two thirds of high schooler, okay, they are worried about getting into college. Okay, so two thirds are worried about, okay, I believe all of you could feel this, you know, oh, am I gonna go into university? Like, am I gonna do well? Where am I gonna go? Or, or that feeling is very real, not just in Singapore, I think even in the, U in the US. Some uh, people argue that certain degrees are not useful. Think about this degree called liberal arts. For those of you who are not familiar with liberal arts, it is a degree where you take non-specific subjects. So if you go into engineering, I took engineering in school, I learned engineering subjects for four years. I took engineering, but there was like a little mixture of electives, like oh, maybe like I took French here, I took maybe business uh, studies for one module, but 80% of my course was about engineering to prepare me for a role, uh, for an engineering role in future, okay? Uh, obviously, I, I didn't become an engineer eventually, um, but there are some subjects, some majors, they cater to students who are looking for non-specific degree. So these are called liberal arts. You go in there, what do you study, guys? You study anthropology, geography, a bit of economics, mathematics, uh, some life sciences, a little bit of, uh, so a bit of everything, okay? It's kind of like roja. Some people believe that liberal arts studies are not preparing students for the real world. I mean, if you really are interested in anthropology, geography, why don't you just go online and learn it? You can learn it, or buy the textbook. It's not necessary to go to a university to take a, spend four years learning like Wikipedia, you know. Um, 
that, that's what people uh, are arguing. These degrees, they're out there just to make money. They are not economically relevant to uh, the graduates. So there's a study that shows that liberal arts graduates, they earn significantly lower compared to STEM graduates. STEM are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. STEM graduates are, um, I would say, okay, people who end up becoming like engineers and uh, scientists, <coughs> they earn more, at least for fresh graduates. But let me give you another side of the story. Okay? This is for those who want to, even want to elevate your arguments. This is only short term. STEM subjects tend to require students to catch up because there's a lot of updates and when it comes to science, when it comes to, uh, say, computer engineering, you've got to keep updating yourself and that puts a strain, uh, some sort of stress um, on people who are working. So you've got to keep working, keep studying. Whereas for liberal arts graduates, you know, the degree itself, it doesn't get outdated that quickly. So the study says that liberal arts graduates gradually caught up with STEM graduates later in life. If you want to use this as a rebuttal, you can go ahead. Yeah? So the two sides of the same argument. Now, another thing, this is pertaining uh, to Singapore. This company called YouGov found that over half of people in Singapore, they are doing things that are unrelated to what they studied. You're looking at one right now. All right. So, what does this show you about university degree? Maybe it's not that relevant anymore because most of you are, st are not going to use your degree anyway. You're just going to take the degree, degree and shove it somewhere. Uh, so more than half are not doing things that are relevant. Okay, uh, for those of you who are wondering like, hey, how come, like, uh, what about all this? Okay, so if you break it down into different industries, okay, finance, infotech, these degrees tend to be more relevant Okay, if you, uh, for your jobs in the future. Okay, and then the other degrees are no, not too relevant. Okay, look at business administration. They end up not doing related stuff. And uh, having said that, right, more than half still believe that their degrees were very useful. Yeah, They're very useful in some ways. Not related, but still useful. But remember this, 99% still feel that having a degree is important. Having a uni degree will help them. Probably not in the job, probably getting into the first job, even an unrelated job. Okay, they might want to see some sort of degree. So note these numbers, more than half, 99%. Okay, next thing, uh, if you guys are preparing for university and you're maybe taking a gap year, why not try out this thing? Right? You can actually learn things online right now with things like MOOCs, okay, massive open online courses. Coursera, Udemy, edX, Udacity. Uh, I use, uh, let me see, I think I, I'm, uh, I have Udemy. I have a Udemy account. I regularly learn things there uh, just to improve myself, okay. Now, these platforms sometimes allow you to learn things that are comparable to what you're learning in prestigious universities. And sometimes even prestigious universities like Harvard, they put up the courses out there and they get credits for it. Uh, edX is one of them, I believe, uh, Coursera. You take a Harvard course, let's say Mathematics 101. You take that, you get a credit, and then when you go to university next time, you can possibly ask for exemption. You say, hey, why do I have to take Math 101 again? I already took it. Can I just skip this module okay, so that I can take other modules you know, or have fun, do other stuff? Uh, that can sort of help you save time. Okay, this is a tip. I haven't tried it myself okay, when I was a graduate, uh, undergraduate these things were not available. But I think I was one of the very first uh, to use, before all this came around, I was attending MIT courses because guys, my professor in university for mathematics calculus professor, that Russian professor, I, oh my God, he sucked, man, he sucked big time. I couldn't understand what he was saying. So I actually go online to look at how MIT, MIT professors were teaching. So I learned from MIT professors. At that time, they were the first to put their courses out there. Anyone can access it, okay? I remember this was still like the time when internet was uh, not that robust, okay? Now, if you look at the courses that people are taking, now I took calculus, uh, but people nowadays, they are taking more advanced courses. Machine learning is one of the more popular courses. This course, machine learning, the fundamentals of machine learning, Okay. It had over 1 million enrollments since 2011. 1 mil. That's a lot. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, this is the guy behind Khan Academy. His name is Salman Khan. He was named 100 most influential people in the world in 2012. Okay, uh, Khan Academy is one of the addition to uh, one of the first one. Um, okay, on top of all these uh, other companies, he made a lot of the courses free. Khan Academy. There are plenty of courses uh, for those who want to learn about coding, uh, even about humanities. You can go there, check it out. Science, oh sorry, science. Uh, education uh, is also becoming increasingly unnecessary, meaning you don't need a degree anymore, even if you want to get a job. More than about two quarters, oh sorry, about two thirds of student developers, developers are people who, who do coding, um, to create websites, to create programs, they say that they at least partially uh, taught themselves, they're self-taught. Okay, so 65% of them. So if you can self-teach, why have someone teach you in a university? All right, um, what about um, education in general? From the government's perspective, then is it worth it to invest in education? Studies have found that, um, yep, in 2019, okay, earnings for college graduates are more than those uh, with just a high school degree or less than that. So if you have a degree, you make more money. Okay, that's it. Now, how much more money? Now, in Washington, the discrepancy is 167%. So let's say you have an uh, A-level uh, uh, de uh, cert versus someone with a degree. Okay? You're going to earn more than twice as much as the person who's, who's just having an A-level cert. So over the course of your lifetime, it can amount up to $700,000 if you, if you see like how much. So if you take a degree, uh, even after discounting how much you spend on a degree, you're still making 700000 more than a person without a degree. So that's what uh, the studies show. There is some usefulness okay, uh, economically, uh, but this is not spread evenly across uh, the United States. Uh, some states, they tend to see less discrepancy, like the state of, uh, I believe, uh, Minnesota. Is it? Oh, sorry, Dakota. Dakota. Uh, I forgot where it is. Uh, but in... Places like uh, New York, 100%, California, 133%. You make a lot more with a degree. Okay, please learn this term, social mobility. That refers to how fast you can climb up the social ladder. Uh, society, um, I mean, controversially, if you put them into like, different status, you have like, the, the low-income families, uh, you have the, okay, please don't call them low class. Yeah. Okay, we call them middle class, but we don't, we, we don't, say, we don't use the word low class, okay? uh, low-income families. Low-income families, middle class, and uh, high-income families, they okay, are always trying to climb up, right, people? And one of the, the solutions to climbing up is to use education. Why do you think your parents are spending so much uh, effort, uh, nagging you, telling you to go to school, telling you to study, all that? Because they want, to, want you to move up the social uh, ranks. This is especially true if you're an immigrant family in the United States. In New York, there are a lot of Asian families. And what are the, some of the top schools in Bronx? Okay, uh, Bronx High School of Science, this is a top school. A lot of the students in there, they are Asian immigrants. They, they study hard, they go to these schools because they believe that this is their ticket Okay, to get them like break out from their immigrant status. Okay, finally they can enter like professional um, working classes. They can move up the social ranks. Okay, <clears throat> okay this is kind of like a counter argument. Okay, um, eighty percent of Singaporeans live in HDB. Now, if your numbers are big enough over here, the people who are watching this, if I do a poll, eighty percent of you are living in HDB. But how many percent of uh, the people actually get scholarship? Based on one study, okay, 60, okay, 60 percent okay, of uh, students who
who got the PSC scholarship come from RI and HCI. Okay, some of you are from Asia and RI here, okay. Um, now, you probably can agree that these are what we call like the elite schools and you probably have also noticed that the social economic status of the, your peers in RI and HCI are quite different from students who are from other JCs right, that I'm not going to name. <clears throat> you see that they are probably a bit richer. Uh, now, this can be seen even uh, for people who take PSD scholarships. Like if you look at the breakdown, 80% live in HDB, but half of them, half of the recipients of uh, PSC live in HDB. So you see the disproportion, okay? There should be 80% if we were equal, but apparently there is something at play here. Seems like the people who are in richer families, they tend to do better in getting scholarships. So it kind of deepens inequality if you ask me. Uh, okay, what's the good thing about getting a degree or a master's degree? Here's the thing, this, learn this theory, it's called a signaling theory. Signaling theory. Signaling theory, I'm gonna repeat myself, signaling theory. This theory won the economics, uh, the economics Nobel Prize in 2001, okay, quite some time ago, but this theory says this, you go to university, not because the degree is useful. From the perspective of the employers, okay, it tells me when I'm hiring, okay, I don't care like uh, you have degree, uh, I don't care like what your degree can do for you, but I care that you bothered to go and take a degree, that you bothered to spend four years or two years or one year for master's degree, okay, spend that effort to take a degree because it tells me okay uh whether it's uh, true or not it tells me that you are probably more hard working than a person without a degree so they tend to associate these positive attributes with person with the degree right so that might motivate some of you to go and get a degree okay this is important for from the employer's perspective you want to start a business i nah, don't forget it okay you're your own boss anyway uh so um, we use uh, signaling theory to kind of explain why a degree is important. The degree itself isn't uh, the value. The value is in like a proof that you are a better employee than someone else without a degree. Now university also allows you to pursue different passion. I would say uh, this is increasingly true in Singapore. If you have different passion, say, oh, I want to do the arts, you can go to SOTA. You can go to NAFA. Uh, you want to do sports, you can go to Singapore Sports School. You want to do science, you can go to NUS High. Uh, if you already have in mind, you want to do some sort of engineering, I uh, want to start uh, doing some culinary stuff, okay, you can go to different things like Polytechnic, ITE. There are a lot of routes for a person to take based on their own passion. So I would say education doesn't just teach you how to read and write and count. It also is a way for you to further uh, your passion, further your abilities in a very niche area. Lee Kuan Yew once said this, uh, okay, oh, one more thing. Besides furthering your passion, it also furthers your curiosity. This is a very fundamental philosophical question about education. Why do we have education? Education is not there to teach you. It's there to keep you curious keep you wanting to learn. Uh, an educated man, Lee Kuan Yew said, is a man who never stops learning and wants to learn. You can paraphrase it in any way you want, uh, but you don't stop uh, learning the moment you stop uh, university. Then you're not an educated person. Okay. Uh, in some ways, I really, really believe in this. I think that's probably what the reason why uh, I'm motivated to take uh, the courses even right now. Okay, that I'm uh -huh. Next question. Okay. This question. I really like this because it's that cross um kind of cross topical sort of uh question. Okay, you have education on one side, you have poverty on the other side. Can education solve poverty? You see people think of education, they think education Fantastic, okay, uh, I see it as a solution. Solution to what? Solution to like all our problems. We can solve poverty, we can solve global warming, we can solve this, solve that. Okay. <clears throat> but a lot of people can agree that poverty is what education is really trying to solve. 
why do we have education in the first place? After the Industrial Revolution, people thought that, hey, we don't have enough workers who are trained to do certain things. So they say, okay, why don't we train human beings like how we run factories? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you guys are one of the factory products. Uh, so, so I think that the mindset that things can be mass produced okay, gave this concept of a school. They say, okay, why don't we put people there and then we'd like, like value add this product so that you know, eventually they can go into school, they can get educated, they can feed the workforce. And uh, before the education was a very privileged uh, thing. You have money, then you can go for education. If you have no money, you come out and work, right? But the labor shortage led to that. Uh, and eventually people saw that education was important to get people employed. It's for employment. So with employment, then poverty will go down. Is that the case? Does education really solve poverty? Our first argument is education empowers the poor. Okay. Uh, a lot of examples uh, you can find, but I think one of the more powerful ones that I found was this person who started this thing called the Barefoot College. Barefoot. Why barefoot? It's catered to people who walk uh, around baref uh, barefooted. Okay? These are people in developing countries, uh, underdeveloped countries. Who do they teach? They teach women. They teach people who are illiterate. Uh, they teach adults, a lot of adults. What do they teach? They teach them how to install solar power. They teach them how to install sanitation. They teach them, uh, they empower them with healthcare knowledge. Okay? Uh, crafts, communication, they teach them life skills that can really help them to like, get employment immediately or get some sort of income immediately. Not like you, you learn math and all these things. You, you can't exactly monetize that. This guy, he, he was featured for teaching a group of women in India in a state called Bihar. Bihar is like a freaking poor state in India. The women were illiterate. They couldn't even count. They couldn't even read. How do you teach them things. So he taught them how to make solar panels, how to assemble solar panels. Now, these things, you, as long as you can see like what colors, how to use a, uh, the soldering devices, you would be, yeah, it would be pretty sufficient for you to, uh, to get employed. So he taught them that and he has empowered a lot of single mothers, women, illiterate women. Now, Barefoot College kind of links to gender. If you are interested in doing gender, have a look at Barefoot College. Hey, education, um, like we mentioned earlier, uh, it, you pump in some money, you get it back. Okay? From the government's, uh, government's perspective, for every dollar they spend on education, they get back in return in terms of GDP growth, right? 10 to $15. $1, you get $10 worth of investment. What kind of investment gives you that sort of returns? Right? What, 1,000% returns? <laughs> this is a lot, a lot of money, 10 to $15. So that it makes sense for governments then to spend on education, especially in developing, underdeveloped countries. Education also improves your livelihood. Maybe it's not for money. Maybe it's not for skills. Maybe it's a bit more dark than that. What if I tell you people go to school, I encourage you to go to school because it improves their rate of survival, that they don't die, guys. Kids in countries like Sudan, they don't have a lot of um, education on basic things that you gotta wash your hands. Oh, I hope they do it right now, man, because of the COVID thing going on. Uh, like hand washing, can you imagine? It's not a common thing. Uh, so schools are actually focusing a lot on teaching them better hygiene, uh, better uh, eating habits, washing their hands, you know, sanitation, uh, where to pee, where to shit. Those things can save their lives, guys, because these are exactly the reasons why a lot of them die from diseases like what? Like diarrhea. Do you know that diarrhea kills people in developing countries? For us, you and me, we're probably just going to have one bad day or two bad days, okay? Take MC, done. But in poorer countries, diarrhea can kill. So some schools in Sudan, they just say, Maybe it's not that important to teach them like math and all these things. I think it's more important to teach them to wash their hands. Yeah. 
Okay, some say, yes, it can solve poverty, but is it always the case? I give you one good rebuttal. You might think that investing in education, from the government's perspective, yes, on, uh, in theory, it will lift people out of poverty, but in reality, is that really true? Education quality in different countries vary. In Pakistan and India, for example, you can go to school, you sit in there, the teacher does not show up. The absenteeism for teachers is so high. Most, I would say, uh, sorry uh, if, if you're watching this from India or Pakistan, but the people, uh, the teachers, sometimes they just get like a hire a young teenager as a relief teacher and they just slack at home. They, they still take salary from the government, but they're not really teaching. So teacher absenteeism is really a problem. Okay? In Singapore, we don't have this problem. Okay? If the teacher goes absent for like two weeks, uh, you guys are going to complain. What is the effect on the children then? 50% they drop out within the first five years. They go to school, they don't see anyone, they don't learn anything, they drop out. Okay? Might as well do something else. 50%, half of them drop out in the first five years of entering a school. Now, again, education perpetuates inequality, so you notice it's a recurring theme. Uh, let me share with you this particular uh, idea of meritocracy. This is bring back to our developed countries like Singapore. This is done in Singapore. You see, meritocracy is about how well you do, how, how, how hard you work. The harder you work, the closer you are to success, in theory. But there are a lot of things at play over here. You see these two families, one from a high-income family, one from a low-income family. They both are smart, IQ 150, but to them, okay, success is not equal. Like they're re them reaching for success is not the same. Yesterday, my friend sent me another, another meme about this meritocracy. Uh, this is the idea of equity, equity or fairness. Yeah? You, we are equal, yes, you get equal opportunities, you go to school, yes, but the, the idea of equity is not there because, and fairness is not there because um, opportunities are not equal for both people here. Yeah. Even though our efforts in helping them might be equal. Here, some useful things you can uh, use. Yeah. In the UK, they have this thing called a grammar school. Grammar school usually reserved for people who are smarter. These, these are public schools. They're funded by the government. But if you look at the people who manage to get into grammar school, you realize that even then, there is still some sort of discrepancy. We're not even talking about private school yet. Huh? We're just talking about public school, like grammar school, like top schools. 70% of grammar school entrants has some sort of private tutoring. Now, we, you know, in the UK, tutoring is not cheap, okay? It's not like in Singapore. Tutoring in the UK, you can afford a tutor, okay, it's, yeah, you, you, are, you, are, you have a bit of money. 3% um, of grammar school pupils are entitled, entitled to free school meals as compared to, I forgot, maybe like more than 10% in the general population. So you can see there's like a, it's disproportionate, okay, learn this word, disproportionate. There are disproportionately high numbers of high income families in grammar school. Again, there are disproportionately high numbers of people in power who are from private schools in the UK, according to a study called Elitist Britain 2019, in the UK. While only 7% of students go to private school, okay, private school you gotta pay, you know, it's kind of like international schools in Singapore. 7% go to private school, but if you look at the cabinet, about half come from private school. If you look at the number of judges, 65% of senior judges come from private school. So again, these people from private school disproportionately dominate the positions of power. Okay, learn this, huh? Disproportionately, the word, disproportionately dominate the people in position of power, okay? Uh, even though it might be just 40%, less than half, it's still disproportionate. Unemployment is an issue in education. Uh, it's tied to education today. Education, I said earlier, is for employment, right? But what if that's not the case? You can use that as a rebuttal, guys. Okay, what is the problem with employment? Check up youth unemployment. 
youth unemployment refers to people who are unemployed while young, okay? People who are actively looking for jobs between age 15 to 24, actively looking for jobs but no job, okay? You, you are not unemployed, okay? Because you have, a, you have better things to do. You're not actively job hunting. There are 75 million young people who are unemployed or underemployed, okay? Mainly because there's a job shortages in countries like Europe. Okay, it's bad, okay, this is job shortage. If I have time, yeah, maybe we can show you guys later. Um, <coughs> and skill mismatch, okay, you graduate with a, I don't know what degree, but the job market requires a certain other skills, okay? You can't get a job, even though there's a short, uh, they, they can't get an employee, you can't get a job. Lose, lose situation. Uh, what, what sort of unemployment is that? Structural unemployment, is that right? Yeah, this is it. Okay, the last question is, uh, it's a very quick one, uh, is should education focus only on what is useful? Uh, ooh, okay. You guys don't mind staying back for a little bit, right? Now, uh, oh, wait, I have a case study for you first. You guys know the country that is very famous for the education system, besides Singapore. Okay. A lot of you would think of this country called, what, let me see if you guys know, eh, I can't see. Hey, how do I see you guys? Okay, ah, yes. Okay, which country comes to your mind? Very, very interesting and robust education system in Europe. Which country is that? You guys can put it in the chat. Huh. Yes, thank you, thank you. Twelve cupcakes. Ah, I like your cupcakes. Um, yes, Finland, Finland, Finland. Eh? Everybody, Norway yeah, to some extent. Norway is not as um, known as Finland. Finland was featured like all over. Okay, Finland, good to know. Uh, today, for the purpose of this crash course, I will not uh, cover Finland for this reason, guys. Um, Okay, because things have changed. Oh, Switzerland. Fantastic. Okay, okay. I think you guys kind of get the idea, okay? It's so those few countries. <laughs> I would like to bring your attention to something that is, okay, very, very updated. Based on 2018 PISA ranking, we have a rising star, guys, like Billie Eilish. Who's the Billie Eilish of education nowadays? Look at this country, Estonia. Estonia, okay. Uh, Okay, I gotta admit that I only learned about Estonia, a country, uh, maybe six years ago. I never heard of this country before. Estonia, oh, I hope, I don't know whether this GIF is working for you. Okay. Anyway, look at Estonia, where it is right now, top 10 across mathematics, science and reading. The education system is winning, guys, okay, besides Singapore. Okay, they are the European, first European country that you see down the list, okay? If you go down the list, you see Asia, 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 Asia. Hey, Estonia, where the heck is it? It's in Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, so for science as well, fifth, reading, fifth, you're thinking, why? And what the heck is Estonia? I have tried very hard to find out information about Estonia for you guys, okay? And here's, oh, <laughs> great. Bye. This is a chart that shows the difference between Singapore and Estonia. Okay, uh, it's pointless for me to list out everything about Estonia for you. I just want you to see like how we're different. We are both very top, top 10. Very robust education system, but we do things very differently. Okay, let's, let's think about the, uh, the, 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 the government policies, right? In Singapore, we are a very top-down uh, system where the ministry will tell you, okay, these are the things you teach, this is how you teach it. Then you come back for training, I'll train you how to teach it, and try as much as possible to teach the way I teach you to teach. Right, right teachers, oh yeah, any teachers here? Correct or not, right? Uh, the centralized nature of Singapore juxtaposes with the very decentralized nature of Estonia. In Estonia, the government says, okay, these are the goals generally, but I'll leave it to you schools to decide how you want to teach it. Every municipality can decide how, what to teach, and then every school 
can then decide what to teach and every teacher again can decide what to teach there's different so every teacher teacher teaches it uh very differently from another teacher within the same school even there's a very decentralized nature of teaching the result is a lot of creativity a lot of um very uh a lot of sharing between teachers because they found that certain things are working for their students and a very uh catered solution for the students cool centralized decentralized the next thing streaming in singapore we have streaming we still have it but it's going to end soon i'm going to share a little bit uh later streaming you know you have your express nant in estonia mixed ability i don't care how well you do i'm going to put you all in the same class and teachers are forced to teach a mixed ability class okay they're forced to confirm with that trying to lift uh the weaker students as much as possible so that they too can benefit from her uh, she, uh her or his classes right mixed ability uh, abilities class in estonia uh singapore somewhat free you guys would think is free but you still have some miscellaneous fees i think a couple of hundred dollars i think uniforms you got to pay for it your ugly uniforms depending on where you come from school materials again you got to pay for it school notes uh your lunch in canteen ah that one you have to pay for right in estonia is really really free completely free even school lunches are provided uniforms are free completely free so um i don't think cost is an issue when it comes to education here but yeah that's a difference though higher education here i told you tuition grant subsidizes 75% of your uni degree first uni degree huh? you want to take five degrees sorry the next four you got to pay yourself but in estonia completely free if you are taking a course in the estonian language okay so if you're thinking hey i want to go there and study ah sorry you got to learn the estonian language before you go there and study for free okay so completely free digital skills in 2020 starting this year our school children after psle are going to take some enrichment course on coding 10 hour of, of enrichment program this is new you can see the company is already trying to push this in 2020 oh but let me tell you something students in estonia start it started in 2012 8 years ago they already started learning coding from grade 1 to grade 4 estonia right now has one of the most digitally literate workforce in the world and they have very fast internet the people is the e nation e nation so e that people made a joke out of his name they call it e estonia they are the smart nation guys um this started many years ago in the 1990s when the president said uh created this program called the tiger leap program to digitize everything to speed up to accelerate um uh e platforms they started teaching school kids from the age of 7 to 19 how to code okay your age right? you probably will be learning how to code <clears throat> okay so that's estonia for you case study for you to use on top of your usual finland your usual you know other countries because yeah like i told you they are the new belarish next question should education focus on what is useful only what is useful now let's talk about what is useful first a lot of people would agree that math to some extent is useful your sciences are useful your language are useful right that's why your pisa is about math science and reading see that okay but is that the only thing that you go to school for okay this one where this is okay, a little more philosophical okay uh the nature of the question is just like that now there's this theory of educational perennialism it says that one should teach the things that will last forever and for people everywhere and it should be teaching you guys principles not facts because facts get outdated and facts don't apply uh it may, it may apply in some countries may not apply in some other countries so maybe the things we teach should be more uh hi there hi there <laughs> jason for class economics so it should be more uh long lasting so this idea of educational perennialism you can use this uh educational perennialists okay as maybe your your opponent perhaps okay what are some of the things that uh you could learn in education values 
Okay, this one I don't have to say much. You guys have character and citizenship education, CCE. In 2014, I believe uh, it has changed uh, in some schools, right? And the uh, focus on values is starting to gain traction. Okay. In the past, people didn't care as much. Next thing, skills. You gotta learn skills, right? What, kind of, what sort of skills? I'm not talking about like cooking skills, la, your counting skills. Oh, cannot see yellow platform. What's that? Cannot see yellow platform. Okay. Uh, Okay, Jovan, any issue with the with the slides? Okay, I hope there's no issue. Uh, anyway, uh, in in Singapore we have this twenty first century competencies framework. This framework was started in twenty uh, thirteen. Right now, you still subscribe to this framework. The government believes that you cannot just learn things. You have to take on a more holistic approach. So things, other things that you gotta learn, they try to they try to imbue into the curriculum are things like self awareness, self management, uh, things that will be useful when you come up to the workforce next time. Communication skill, collaborative skills, critical thinking. What we try to teach you in GP, literacy, civic mindedness, responsibility, all these things that are just not taught in like individual subjects alone. So this twenty first century uh, competency competencies framework, please learn it. Okay. Uh, it's very important for our holistic uh, education. Next, we often argue, science, arts, is there, should we focus a little bit more on the arts? Because we kind of feel that we focus a lot on the sciences, but we have neglected the arts. Lee Kuan Yew, again, he said this. He said, poetry is a luxury we cannot afford. That was back in the 1960s. He said that at a time when Singapore was still a poor, developing country. Okay. And there was a lot of focus then on subjects that actually help us uh, move the country forward, like sciences. So he was right, to some extent. But is he still right? I'll leave that to you to think about. Can we still not afford poetry? Hey, think about people like George Orwell who wrote 1984, who wrote Animal Farm. Hmm? He wrote this, okay, um, uh, this uh, book called 1984. He said, without wisdom, morality, things that arts can teach us, science can, and technology will lead us to destruction. You lead, you educate a whole generation of uh, only scientifically literate people. Hmm. Okay. Uh, he argues that we are gonna have, we're gonna see some unintended consequences. Now, you could also look at science and arts as complementary subjects. Art can complement science. This dude, Leonardo da Vinci, he was a scientist. Okay. Uh, yet, at the same time, you guys know about his draw paintings on Mona Lisa and all that. He was also an artist. It was his artistic um, prowess that enabled him to pursue his scientific studies. So he was very good at drawing prototype, drawing human organs. He took out human organs, he studied, okay, this is how the heart looks like, he drew it out. That was how he used both part of his brain, right? Uh, to, uh, to for that synergy between science and art. Lastly, can science complement art then? Art helps science, yes, but can science help the art? Think about this, uh, uh, the studies of uh, uh, history. Now, history looks at theories about what's possible, what happened, what caused the fall of the Roman Empire, for example. If you look at what caused the fall of the Roman Empire, you find like 100 theories out there. But which is the cause? Some causes are even contradictory. We can now use mathematical models to study this. We can create the models. And then we can test out these models. So I create like 100 models and I test. Okay, over time, did this same model work? Which model, which theory okay, uh, was most likely to work? That is using mathematics and uh, using like data science to explain, to, to calculate uh, history. We have gone to that extent using science to study art. That study, 
this branch of study is called Clio Dynamics. Clio, not your Clio magazine, okay? Clio is your, uh, it means history. History Dynamics, Clio Dynamics. Okay, that 